Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Tomorrow morning I will go to Belgium for the rest of the week, but I got so many requests from you guys to test for Honor that I decided to try my best to at least get a preliminary netcode analysis done before I leave. The reason why I say preliminary is that for Honor uses a network model that I have not encountered yet. But before we get into that, we must take a look at a few networking basics so that you understand the results of my tests. The reason why I include this basic information in every video is that I do not want that someone who is new to those netcode analysis videos must watch another video first to understand what the analysis is about. Also I've noticed that it does not really work to tell your viewers to watch another video first, which then leads to them drawing the wrong conclusions or they simply do not understand the information which I share in the video. Now, if you already know the networking basics from one of my previous videos, then you can use the timecode link inside the description of this video to skip that part. Sadly, I cannot provide you with an annotation anymore, because YouTube decided that the new end screen disables annotations, and I cannot use the cards feature to provide you with a skip function, as a card is not allowed to link to the same video. So thank you YouTube for killing that feature for me. Let's start with the ping. Now, what is that and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October, then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to check the distance to the US submarine with one active sonar ping. The way this works is that your ship sends out an audio signal which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. And on your ship you have microphones which then hear that reflection. If you then measure the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection, then you can calculate the distance between you and the object. The ping that we talk about for network connections is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. Now, when you measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then this gives us the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long the data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes the data to get to its destination, the bigger the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs. Which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then this information takes some time to reach the server and then the other client. With short distances between the players, this delay or lag is also very short. But when the distance gets bigger, then the clients have to wait longer until they receive an update on what is going on. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which leads to a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the high ping player can also give the low ping player a bad experience. But that is a different topic. So the distance between the client and the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. However, you can't take a map, draw a line between your home and the location where the server is hosted and then calculate your ping based on that distance, because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it even reaches the server. So when a router has to forward data, then it always tries to find the best and fastest route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data will take the shortest route to the game server. However, it can happen that a router either chooses the wrong route or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you always play on the same server and suddenly notice that your ping increased, then this could be caused by the routing. And if this is the case, then you have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. If you want to help them to get the issue fixed faster, then you can open the command prompt, type in tracer and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server with the pings between you and every of those hops. With that information, it will be much easier for your ISP to track down the issue and fix it. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. This means that our lag cannot get lower than the ping since we would have to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used to communicate with the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive updates 30 times per second, then there is more time between the updates than when we send and receive 60 updates per second. 
So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where's that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when you have a tick or simulation rate of 30, then this will cause more delay than when you have a tick rate of 60, which also allows update rates of 60 Hz then. Now, what kind of options do developers have when it comes to providing servers? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware, the data center provides enough bandwidth to handle all the players that connect to it, and the players are not able to see each other's IP addresses. At least as long as the game does not use a bad peer-to-peer -peer voice over IP solution. Also, if the developers ensure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that some players have an unfair advantage. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of having the community run these servers, then the publisher or game studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another problem is that when you release your game worldwide, then you also need to make sure that you have enough server locations to provide all players with low latency servers. If you don't do that, then you create many hyping players and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. The other approach is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he becomes the server. With this solution, the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers, which must be available in many different regions. This also allows players in remote regions to play with their local friends at relatively low latency. One of the downsides is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage because he has zero lag, which means that in a first person shooter he will see you before you see him and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. It is also possible for the host to further exploit this by artificially increasing the ping of all the other players, which is called lag switching. And the host also sees the IP addresses of all the other players that connect to him, which is, in my opinion, quite a big security concern. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer-grade internet connection, when in the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most frustrating part of such client-hosted matches is that if your host disappears, then the game must choose another player to host the match, which means that the whole game pauses for several seconds until the host migration has finished. So while dedicated servers do not magically provide 100% lag-free connections, they still offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games. So, as I said in the beginning of this video, I have never tested a game that used a network model that is similar to the one in For Honor. When players say that a game uses peer-to-peer -peer instead of dedicated servers, then they usually mean that one client is the host which runs the simulation. That's in example what Call of Duty uses. But For Honor actually uses a peer-to-peer -peer network model. This means that we do not have a dedicated server, nor is a client elected to host the match and run the simulation. However, one client is elected to be the session host which takes care of invites and handshakes. In For Honor, every client runs its own synchronized simulation and sends its data to every other client. This means that every client is also partially a game server. The pros of this setup are that the publisher or studio does not have to pay for expensive servers that must be hosted in many different regions. Players in remote regions can play with their friends at relatively low pings. And this model should not suffer from the host advantage issue that client hosted games have. However, I'm not quite sure how true that is since every client is also partially a host, so this will require further testing. One downside of this network model is that the game will pause for a few seconds when the session host leaves, as another client then must take over his function. That said, this does not take as long as when the game host disappears in a client hosted match. Another downside is that because every client runs its own simulation, the responsiveness of the hit registration will probably also vary depending on the ping of the player you engage. So when you fight a player to which you have a ping of 5 milliseconds, then the hit registration might feel better than when you engage a player to which you have a ping of 148 milliseconds. This is one of the things that I want to test more once I get back from Belgium. Probably the biggest downside of this model is a security concern, as every game client knows and sees the WAN IP addresses of the other players. 
Then there are also a few things that I'm not quite sure about yet, which is why I called this video the preliminary netcode analysis of For Honor. So since every client runs its own simulation, what kind of effect does underpowered hardware have on the hit registration? How does the hit registration work when more than two players engage each other, especially when it comes to blocking? How does the hit registration handle engagements when there is a ping difference of more than 100 milliseconds between players? And what effect do ping spikes and packet loss have? These are questions that I want to look into soon. Now, how frequently do clients send and receive data? When we take a look at the network data captured in Wireshark, then we can see that For Honor does not use a fixed rate at which data is sent and received. But when I look at the delta time of 100 updates, then the average update rate is 43 Hz, so 43 updates per second. Now, what does this mean for the delay that we have between two players? To test this, I use a high-speed camera, two PCs where each of them has its own fiber internet connection, and 144 Hz gaming monitors on which the game runs at more than 144 FPS, with all graphic options set to the lowest value. To measure the delays between the players, I point my high-speed camera at the monitors, and then do 20 light attacks with player 2. Inside the high-speed recording, I then look for the frame where I see that player 2 starts with his attack, and then I count the frames until I see the attack start on the monitor of player 1. In addition to this gunfire test, I also performed two movement tests. In the first one, player 2 does a roll, and I count the frames until I see the player model update on the monitor of player 1. In the second test, player 2 moves to the side, and then I count the frames until I see his player model move on the monitor of player 1. So after I did each of these tests 20 times, I got an average of 110 milliseconds in the attack test, 112 milliseconds in the roll test and 109 milliseconds in the walk test. Now, please keep in mind that these are the results from tests where I had a ping of just one millisecond between the players since both use the same internet service provider. So when we consider that the average update rate is 43 Hertz, which means that an update is sent and received every 23 milliseconds, then this delay of 110 milliseconds on average is very, very high. And I have to wonder if this is caused by the client synchronizing its simulation with the other clients, or if there is some other delay happening between receiving an update and displaying it on the monitor. Now, to be fair, For Honor is not a shooter, which means that higher delays are probably not that much of an issue. However, such a high base delay is not ideal when you consider that the ping of the players is added on top of it. Also because For Honor does not use dedicated servers nor a client to host the match, the responsiveness of the hit registration will probably also differ depending on which player you engage, as you won't have the same ping to every player. Now there's one more thing that I noticed which is not related to the netcode. Right now the volume of my USB microphone is at 95% and the volume of the microphone that is connected to my sound card is at 100%. When I then drop the voice over IP volume slider to 0% inside of For Honor, then this also sets the volume to 0% for my microphone that is connected to my sound card. And when I go through all my input devices, then For Honor sets their volume to 0% as well, which is simply unacceptable. When you change the VoIP volume inside an application, then this must only affect the volume inside that application and not change it on the operating system level. So I hope that this gets fixed in one of the next patches. Now, before I end this video, I once more want to thank my patrons for their continued support, because making these videos is very expensive, as I must buy two copies of every game I test, since I don't get review copies from publishers or game studios. So I hope that you enjoyed this first netcode analysis of For Honor, and if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me through Patreon. The link is in the description below. Also, if you want to know what I'm currently working on, then you can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. The links are also in the description of this video. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe for more, and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.